Okay. Today is Tuesday, August 9th. How about May 9th? May. May 9th, <laughs> 2006. I am interviewing Monsignor Wendelin Vetter. Uh, it's a pleasure to conduct the interview of Dakota Memories Oral History Project in Hillsboro, North Dakota. Can you please state your full name? Just Wendelin Vetter. No middle name, nothing. <laughs> I was born in uh, northeast of Strasbourg at uh, what they call uh, Sacred Heart, Rosendahl, uh, about nine miles northeast of Strasbourg on a farm in October 5th, 1933. Did you ever hear any stories about your birth? No, didn't hear any about my birth. <laughs> okay. Um, can you share some of your earliest memories that you have? Well, we moved from Strasbourg over to south of Napoleon in 1935, so I would have been a little over two years old then. And I remember uh, we was a farm two miles south of where our home farm was, uh, which was 15 miles south of Napoleon, straight south. And I was trying to give little chickens a ride on my red wagon, and they wouldn't stay on. So... I finally wrung their neck and put them in and came up with the, to the house to mom and said, Mom, look, they're in the wagon. <laughs> you know, they were all dead. <laughs> uh, so that's what the earliest ones. <laughs> um, what was it like growing up on the plains? Well, you didn't know any different, so that's point one. We grew up in 1937, I think it was, or 36. Uh, we moved to the farm that I finally, where I grew up, which was about a mile north of that farm where, uh, where I killed those chickens. And um, we, lived in a <clears throat> we lived in a stone house. The house was made out of mud and stone with a little bit of cement facing on the outside, plastered cement. Walls were probably around two feet thick uh, because there were rocks with dirt in between. And uh, we had four rooms in the house. There was the kitchen, stoop, the, you know, the living room, and then there were two bedrooms, one for parents and one for us. And there were five of us boys. And uh, all five of us slept in the same bed. Cause, and uh, we had a pump, a uh, a well inside the house, which was probably about 15 feet deep, it was surface water. And you could get maybe, uh, oh, 15 gallons of water at a time. And uh, uh, we would wake up in the winter time, and the pump, the well was frozen, the water on the stove was frozen. And we five boys, three would sleep in the, the pillow end, and two would sleep at the foot end. We had a big feather tick. And we stayed warm that way. And we all grew up. So then, uh, for for uh, for heat, we were too poor. We you know the, we had no money. Like Dad, sometimes while they had an old car, didn't have any money for gas, and he would ride, take the pony, and ride to town, which was fifteen miles, uh, to get tobacco, get sugar, and some of the essentials, and. Uh, for uh, heat, we burn cow manure. I don't, know if, I don't know if you've gone through that. Russian peat moss? Have you heard of that? I've heard of it, but could you go ahead and explain Okay, it? well, in the wintertime, when we clean the barn, you would separate the horse manure from the cow manure because horse manure had too much straw in it or too, uh, undigested uh, um, hay. The cow manure was more liquid and so forth. So we would put that out and uh, make it in a kind of a bed, probably about two feet deep. And you shovel the snow away and you put the next days on there and so forth. So when spring came, uh, when it's thawed out, we would take the horses and tie them together and then have them trample the, the mud, I mean not the mud, the manure down. And then we take some planks with stones on them and smooth it out, run the horses over it again, let it settle a few days, run the horses over again, and smooth it out. Then when it dried out somewhat, then we'd take a spade and we would cut that manure. And it would be cut, oh, 
probably uh, about 12 inches wide and 6 inches thick. And, you know, the height would be probably about 12, 15 inches. And you would stack that, and you'd stack it two up, one on top, to let it dry. And then when it got that got fairly dry, you put it into a bigger pile. So when it was fully dry, you'd put it into a shed. And uh, the, that's what we burned in the wintertime. And, of course, at night when you go to bed, you stop, put, the, put that in the stove. But it would, that would only burn about maybe an hour or two, and then it would be out. And so in the, mother, in the morning, it would be very cold. So, yeah, the disgusting thing about the manure was, you know, when we cut it, there were these maggots in there. They were about the size of your finger, you know, these horse manure, fly maggots or whatever, big things, you know, and didn't care for that. But <laughs> but that's how we survived uh, as far as, because we couldn't buy coal, there was no wood, and that's all we had. Yeah, that works. Mm-hmm. I would say the camaraderie with neighbor kids and, well, the church was the center. Uh, we had St. Anthony Parish and uh, we had um, a social hall there. And Father Bolte, who was from Germany, uh, was our priest. And he, uh, Bolte is B O L T E. And uh, died about five years ago. But anyway, uh, he he really worked on us kids to learn English because you know I when I started grade school uh, I was five going on six I didn't know a word of English because everything was German and uh, you know I remember two things I remember from that cl classroom was you know I, since I didn't know a word of English the teacher would hold up a flashcard and of course she was German Russian so she knew the language but she'd hold up two flashcards I remember one was flowers and I raised my hand Bluma! And then the other one was a turkey, Belchona. <laughs> but by the time the first year was over, I'd, I'd learned, learned English. And I was, the second year I went to school, I was in the third grade. I skipped the second grade. Uh, so uh, then I, that's why I graduated from high, grade school when I was 12. Uh, skipped a grade. But anyway, uh, we would, the, the church was the center. And we would get together, uh, you know, religion class, we had sodality. And Father would make us get up in front of the class, of the group and give like a one-minute talk. And of course, we'd be scared to death to do that. But he insisted. He says, you're going to grow up, you have to learn English, and you have to learn how to speak in front of people. And, uh, and then we'd graduate to a two-, three-minute talk. Then to get us more out in the open, uh, <clears throat> we would put on three-act plays, regular full-length three-act plays. <coughs> We put them on in our hall, and then we went on the road, like we went to Zealand and some of the other towns, and put them on. Uh, so it was a way of getting us to speak English, get around people, and things like that. So it was a lot of fun. We had our own softball team. Uh, we would play uh, places like Venturia, Wishick, Arda, South Dakota, uh, Strasbourg, Napoleon, Bernstead. And the thing was, you'd have to bring your own umpire. So my dad would be the umpire. And we would put, he would, we had a 1946 Chevy truck, grain truck. And so the whole team and all the girls, all of us would get into the grain box. And dad would drive the truck and take us to the different places on Sunday for the ball softball games. And we had a great time. And it was just a lot of fun. Uh, another enjoyable thing was fishing. Now we didn't have any crick you know, anything, but there was a dam called Park Wilkie's Dam. Uh, Park Wilkie was the only non-Catholic in the area. However, before he died, Father Bolte converted him. So he died a Catholic. Uh, but it, we had a totally Catholic community. Like in school, uh, the priest would, would come out oh, maybe every two weeks and give us religion instructions right in you know, stop classes, and he would teach all of us in the school. Uh, when I taught school, I would, um, I started teaching in 1948 when I was 14 going on 15, and then again in 1950 and 1951. Uh, 
I entered the seminary in the fall of 52. But uh, if, if it was a feast day, no school. Uh, in the morning, instead of having the Pledge of Allegiance, we prayed the Rosary uh, as our opening for the school day, public school. But we were all Catholic, so no problem. So we enjoyed it. But anyway, uh, let's see, I lost my thought on that one. <laughs> I was talking about fun times, fishing. Okay, the fishing. Fishing, all we could get at Park Wilkie's Dam were perch once in a while and bullheads. And so we would shoot a blackbird or two uh, for meat, and then we'd cut it up into small pieces and put it on the bullheads would fight, bite on it. And, of course, the, some of the bullheads were only about you know six inches long, so we put them in the stock tank hoping they would grow bigger so we could eat them later on. Uh, they never did grow bigger, but, uh, but anyway, we tried. But that was our Sunday afternoon fun. You know, quite a few of us were over there. We had bamboo poles uh, that we used, put a string on it, and a bobber and a bamboo pole, and that's what we used for fishing. So, um, so those were the two things, playing softball and the fishing during the summer. Wintertime was a lot of fun. Uh, I loved fall and winter because fall you, everything slowed down and especially when I wasn't going to school or teaching you know and uh, you'd get every get the cattle home and then in the evenings the young people would get together at someone's farm and we'd go by bobsled and we'd go through one farm uh, <coughs> one farmstead after another and pick up the young people as we on the bobsled as we get there when we get to somebody's place, we would have ice cream. We'd make homemade ice cream, and we'd play cards, and uh, just have a, a lot of fun. And probably about ten thirty, eleven, we'd head home. Uh, but that was kind of our social life. See, in, in the winter time, our roads were blocked. Like I can remember, nineteen fifty, fifty one. Uh, I went uh, fifty two. Our roads were blocked from from December until March. In fact, I was going to summer uh, spring quarter at ND, at Element, Element, Ellendale Teachers College, and we could not get out. Uh, so the highway was three miles south of our farm, and so I went down the by sled went to the highway, and then uh, met somebody there and got a ride to Wishick. And there I took the train to Allendale and Menango, which was about 12 miles north of Allendale. And they came out from Allendale and picked me up and took me to college there. Uh, but the, the roads would usually be blocked uh, in the winter. They just didn't get them open. It used to be more snow than we have today, I think. Uh, at least that's my memory. So we had a lot of fun. With softball, how did... How did your softball games compare to a softball game today? Like bats, we were basically, no, we were so fast pitch. Okay. And, uh, you know, we had some guys that were good pitchers and a lot of fun. I myself didn't play. I wasn't good enough. Uh, but um, my job was to rattle the pitcher. You know, get the jar, get this talk going. And usually about the fifth or sixth inning, a lot of times, I would get on his nerves and you know, and he'd start start throwing balls and stuff, and we'd get some runs. So we had a good time. What kind of card games did you guys play? You guys we played Perfrons, Canasta, but not that much. Pinochle was the most common one, and Whist. Okay. So those, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they still. I I can still play Perfrons. I per, I enjoy Pinochle more. Canasta, I've forgotten. That's more of a woman's game anyway, I think. <laughs> Play that game. <laughs> <laughs> what was one of the most unpleasant memories or aspects of growing up on a plane? I really can't pick out anything. Uh, probably the milking of cows. I mean, it, it was like we milked by the time I left home. We were mil up to milking, mil milking up to thirty-five cows all by hand, and you know, and especially in the winter time, you know, the cows would be in their stall, and some of the most unpleasant things was sit there milking, and the, she'd swish her tail, you know, soaked in urine right across your face. Uh, that was not pleasant, you know, and try and clean it off. But uh, 
Other than that, it was pretty good. Uh, tell me about your family. Let's start with your on your mother's side. Okay, my mother's side, uh, Grandpa was John P. Schumacher, and Grandma was Julia Geffrey. Grandpa came. Grandpa came over as a two-year-old from Russia, about. 1892-93. Uh, as a young man, he helped build the railroad from Pollock, South Dakota, over to Zealand and over to Strasburg, that area. Uh, Grandma came over also about the same time as a two-year-old girl. And uh, they settled, their parents settled right by Zealand. Saint, uh, the church they went to was St. John's Church, about five miles north of Zealand which was, that was the mother church of that whole area. It's burned down now. It's gone. But um, Grandpa was a good farmer, hardworking. On, on my mother's side, there was no play. They worked very hard. Uh, my, mother ha my mother was one of ten children. Uh, the oldest one was Sebastian, then Magdalene, Catherine, and Mom was fourth. And so on. Uh, and Mom had to work like a boy, uh, she she was a she was a farmhand, and so she never learned how to cook. When she got married, her in-laws had to teach her how to cook because Grandma did all the cooking, and she never worked in the field. So Mom had to work out there with the with the men. Uh, Grandpa, as I said, Grandma. I mean, first, my mother went to grade school. She got she got as far as the eighth grade. Never passed it. She didn't make the test. In those days, you had to take a test to pass, and she didn't make that. Um, but the nice thing, Grandpa Schumacher, he um, he gave each of his ten children, when they got married, two quarters of land. He bought them, each one, boys or girls, didn't make any difference. They could go out and get settled somewhere, and then he would buy the, the farms that the two quarters of land for each one of the children. So uh, so he, he was successful, but they worked hard. On the Vetter side, now, Grandpa's address was Venturia, although they were halfway between Venturia and Sela. Uh Grandma Schumacher, Grandpa. And uh, on the Vetter side, um, that was John J. Vetter, and his wife was Magdalena Unser, U-N-S-E-R. And uh, they came over from Russia in 1898 with one child, two weeks old. They left Russia when Uncle John was two weeks old, and they were a young married couple. And they brought along Grandpa's sister, I think her name was Marianne, but anyway, she was blind. And so when they came to Ellis Island, they were held up for a while, because they weren't sure they were going to let her in. And so Grandpa, they had to sign papers that they would be responsible for her care, that she would not be a ward of the state. So they came over and settled uh, northeast of Strasbourg there at Sacred Heart, Rosendot. And um, they had about ten children also. And, um, but they were more on the music, the vetters were, the, were on the musical side. Uh, they sang, they, they, they played, not so much instrument, but just singing. Uh, they enjoyed life, getting together, singing. Whenever they get together, they'd sing German songs and stuff like that. Whereas that was not on the Schumacher side. Schumacher was, you work. Whereas the Vedders, you would work, but you also played. And uh, however, none of us kids picked up, you know, Dad was a good singer, a beautiful voice, but none of us picked it up. We were all like the Schumachers more, <laughs> on that sense. Um, let's see. I don't know what else I can tell you about. Uh, they had about ten children. Two of them died in infancy. One was Peter and one was Rosina. And so when the youngest child they had was again named Rosina. Of that family... Only one is alive, Aunt Mary Smith. <clears throat> she lives in San Leandro, California, and she's 93 years old. Still lives on her own. She walks over a mile every day, drives her own car, 
and everything. I, I go out to see her every year for her Christmas, for her birthday, which is on February 3rd. So I was out there again this past year here. Uh, a remarkable woman, mind as clear as a bell. If you, if you could ever interview her, she'd, she'd have a lot of stuff to say because she grew up you know, in those days more than I did. Uh, Let's see what else. They, they, Grandpa Vetter at one time was rich, was well to do. However, in the thirties he lost everything, and um, so they moved to town and they, you know, they just had a subsistence life there, uh, which you know was a tough time. Going back, and I'm the oldest. You want to get into that? Sure. I'm the oldest of... Uh, my mother had 12 children. The first one was a stillborn boy. And then I was born October 5, 1933. And, uh, and I have a brother, Willie, who is two years younger. Uh, and then brother, Mike, he is a year younger than Willie. And then Jim, a year younger than Mike. And... Dan, Daniel, a year younger than Mike, Dan, Jim, and then uh, Mary Ann, she was born in 41. She, she'd be about two years younger. Then Mom lost two girls. One in 43, Pauline. She was two weeks old. She died of dehydration. Those days, you know, you get a fever. Well, we were on the farm, and by the time they got her to the hospital in Bismarck, it was too late. Then in... Uh, in 1946, then Magdalene was born in 44. Uh, she only lived a half a day. She was, they were, we were all born on the farm. And uh, she was uh, cleft palate, crippled, and lived a half a day. Then in 1946, my brother Clarence was born. And in, 19, in 1950, my mother lost an, another boy. She, she was about four or five months pregnant. And it was in March, and it was a horrible time. Uh, a storm was coming in. Mom had miscarried, and she was bleeding profusely. And this is out on the farm. We had no phone. So I had to get on the sled and go to a neighbor, which was about four miles away, who had a phone, and call the doctor. The highway was open, but we were three miles north of the highway. So he came out. Uh, as far as he could, and by horse and sled, went down the highway to get him and bring him in. And he said, you know, he's got to get her to the hospital, otherwise she'll die. Well, we were 80 miles from Bismarck, from the hospital. So the, they put four horses in front of the car and just pulled the car right over the snowbanks and had the ambulance waiting at the highway. Three, and... Uh, they beat, the storm was coming in. Dad tried to follow in the car, 48 Ford, and uh, the ambulance got ahead of him. Ambulance beat the storm. Dad got caught in the storm. And they said, they got in about midnight or so, and they said if it had been another six hours, she'd have been dead, you know, from the hemorrhaging and stuff. But in 19, this is 1950, and in 1950, 51, my mother had her last child, a daughter, and uh, Loretta. And she almost miscarried her in August, uh, again hemorrhaging, but she was born in November. And so that was the 12 children that my mother, that my mom and dad had. So eight of us are still alive. And what's happened to us is that all six boys have now come down with prostate cancer. We all have it. The last one was had surgery last week. And Brother Mike is dying from it. Uh, it spread on his case. So uh, it's, you know, it's been a, kind of a tough time. But going back, uh, I enjoyed school. Uh, it was, for me, school was easy and it was fun. And I don't know, in the community, it was always thought that someday I'd be a priest. Now, uh, you know, I didn't do anything special or so forth, but the people just felt that you're going to be a priest. And... So, you know, I thought about it, forgot about it in high school, started teaching, went to college, started college, and then it came back again. And so, um, anyway, my father, I entered, I went to high school in Zeeland, North Dakota, in the fall of 1946. 
Now, the German Russians at home were against education uh, because, and in, if you read the annals in in, Germ in Russia, at first they were against education too, because we came out of the Alsace-Lorraine area, and we were the battleground between France and Germany, and we were always put upon by the educated ones, and so the feeling was education corrupts you. And so if you're going to be a good person, you work hard, and yes, you need to read and write, but that's as far. So when I graduated from grade school at age 12, I wanted to go to high school, and my parents said, no, one, we don't have any money. Those days there were no buses or anything. You had to board in school. So I cried and I cried and begged, and so they finally said, okay, if Grandpa, Grandma Schumacher keep you for nothing, uh, board and room, then you can go, but when it was raining that fall, but if when it dries up, you have to come home for the thrashing. And so I got to go. Grandpa and Grandma said they would keep me. If at, at Zealand in those days, you could have a cow and chickens and so forth right in town. So uh, I, if I milked the cow and do that and take care of the chickens, then they would keep me. So that's what I, that was our agreement. And... Um, when the weather cleared up, I dropped out of high school for three weeks and went home and did the help thrashing and then went back. Uh, but it didn't hurt me any. I still got, I had all A's except one B uh, that year. It was, it, was, it was fun, but it was a little tough. I had a guy, Leo Locker was his name. Uh, who, see, I was 12 going on 13 and, and from Napoleon, so I didn't know any of the kids. And he was the bully. And he would just <coughs> bully me and bully me. And finally one afternoon, I'd had enough. <coughs> and he was bigger than I was, but I was faster. And I just took him and wrestled him to ground and pinned him. And after that, I had no trouble anymore with him. But uh, remember the picture of the, in 1946, the school picture. I'm in front kneeling, and I'm wearing suspenders and a belt. <laughs> People are laughing, at, you know, laughed at it, you know. want to make sure my pants didn't fall down. But... Dad got sick then, and I'm the oldest in the family, so I had to stay home on on the farm. And that's when I took my high school, took my high school uh, by correspondence, uh, Chicago, American school in Chicago in one year. I took my freshman, so my sophomore, junior, and senior year. And then when at age 14, which was 1948, after World War II, they were short of teachers since I had some high school, uh, I was hired to... Uh, teach public school grades one through six. I was 14 going on 15. The oldest student was 12 going on 13. And uh, then I taught again when I was 16, when I was 17. And I took a year of college by correspondence and at uh, night school. Then I was 18, 1952. Uh, 18 going on 19 is when I entered the seminary at St. John's at Collegeville. And uh, Spent two years at St. John's, then I went to St. Paul's Seminary in 1954 and was ordained in 1960. So I'll be, I'll be retiring on uh, June 28th this year. I'll have 46 years in of, of ordination, priesthood. So. so what would you like, what other questions do you have? You mentioned that people in the community kept thinking that you were going to be a priest. priest. Did they ever tell you why? I think part of it was this. Well, they saw me as being very brilliant, and I think that's kind of. They even picked out uh, a, a one of the neighbor girls, Christina Brendel was her name. She was going to be my housekeeper. Uh, they had her picked out. Christina got married to someone else, though. Uh, so I think that's why, because when we'd have catechism, sometimes during mass we'd have catechism or before mass, and. I would, you know, if there's a question to answer, I, I would know the answer. So I enjoyed education, man. My father loved to read, and my mother thought it was an absolute waste. And Dad loved to read these pulp westerns. Those days you could buy these pulp westerns for about 25 cents a copy. And he would have them hidden out in the barn, you know, under the hay and stuff. And so when he was out cleaning barn, he would sneak in some reading time and so forth. And I, I'd find them and read them. And, and so, uh, and I, you know, those days you didn't have, have much of a library at school. But uh, 
I read all the books they had, like the the history books and things. Uh, history was almost my always my favorite subject. I enjoyed it. So, so I think that's why. You mentioned that when you started school, you you only knew German. Right. What was it like during that first year trying to learn English? Was the school strict about it? Yeah, Moses down. Uh, the school was yes. You know, there was a fire guard around the school. Uh, those days, you know, you had to worry about prairie, fi prairie fires, and especially in the fall. So they would have a fire guard around the school ground. And the rule was when you stepped inside the fire guard, you had to speak English. And of course, we would try and sneak by. So whenever we got caught speaking German, we'd have to go up on the board and write 100 times, I will not speak German again. I will not speak German again. Uh, that type of thing. Uh, but I, d I don't recall it being hard. I mean, you know, things came easy for me. For lunch, you always had to bring lunch. We brought lunch. lunch. Uh, what did you take to lunch? We would have uh, bread with uh, usually joke jerry jam. Uh, and maybe an apple. And that would be basically it. Uh, sometimes we, our farm was only a quarter of a mile from school. So on nice days, we would run home and eat sometimes and go back again. So that, that was kind of nice. What about the teachers you had? Was there one you especially liked? One that was well, the one who was the most notable one was Toots Welder. Uh, and I don't even know her first name now. She was married to Joe Welder. I had her for three different years, and I had her in my first year. And, and she was good. She was a good teacher. She ended up having Alzheimer's in her later years, and she's dead now. But uh, she was a good teacher, and I think kind of challenged me and made me move ahead. During, during recess, what kind of activities would you do? We would play ball. Uh, we were too poor; we couldn't buy a ball, so we'd make we'd take a take a uh, inner tube and cut it off, cut it up into ribbons, and then wrap them up, and then we'd take a piece of canvas, and then uh, sew that around the the inner tube, the rubber ball, and we'd use two by fours or any piece of wood for a bat. So that was uh, one. The other one would be prisoner's base. Come, come, come! Pull away, Andy over where you throw the ball over the, you know that type of thing. Hide and seek. Those were the the common ones. Let's discuss your your parents a little more. Let's start with your father. Um, can you describe what he was like? His character. Dad was fun loving. Uh, the one he he enjoyed life. Whereas mom was much more serious, uh, you know, the Schumacher side, they worked hard, and that's what you live for. Whereas on the Vetter side, at least my observation, you worked, but you also played and you enjoyed life. So dad was very good. Uh, he would, in those days, the father of a family was known usually as the old man. And he would have, he would sit and have his own chair, he have his own place, and he did not talk to his children as a rule, you know, and then, you know, unless something was necessary. But other than that, he was on his own. My father was different. My father played with us. He'd play ball. He was the only adult male who would, on, on the softball games, who would go with us and take us to different places. Uh, mother would complain because she would say, Sunday afternoon you should sleep and rest so you can work the rest the rest of the week. But dad was out there with us. The other thing that I really liked about my father was my father, he, he enjoyed young people and he knew their names and he always had something nice to say, uh, of, you know, teasing them, but it was an uplifting type of teasing, not a down, anything downplaying. And so as I've grown older, uh, I have, I've tried to emulate that, that I would always, as I deal with our young people, always try to recognize them, help them to come to know their abilities 
and, and raised them up. My father was an, ended up being an alcoholic. Uh, however, he was a happy drunk. He had a, sh had a, hard, he had a short temper, a short fuse when he was sober. But when he drank, he would uh, be happy and just want to sleep. So we were very fortunate that way. Uh, that he finally overcame it on his own, but it, it took him quite a few years. So our family suffered from that, as did many other families. Mom, on the other hand, as I said, uh, she she didn't get angry fast, but when she, once she got angry, it would take two or three days to cool off. Uh, so Mom never praised us. She would... Um, if if we did something good, uh, the only way she would show that it was good was she'd fix a dessert for dinner or something like that. But other than that, praise was not in her vocabulary. She was a good woman, uh, a very strong woman. I mean, uh, she was the businessman of the family. Uh, my parents, when they started farming, they had nothing. Uh, when they finished, they had two sections of land. Uh, so you know, and much of it was due to my mother. She was the business person of the of the family. Um, she, you know, as we talk uh, as brothers and sisters, the one we quote is our mother. It's amazing how she instilled things, you know, values into us that we just didn't didn't even know at the time. I remember my mother, you know, the first five of us were boys. And she would tell us, now, you never date a girl that you wouldn't be willing to marry. Uh, she says, if you date a girl that you don't respect, then you don't respect yourself either. Uh, and, you know, none of my five brothers had to get married in a sense of pregnancy. She, all, her other big point was, you know, if you ever date a girl, you treat her like a queen. You know, otherwise, don't date her. And if you ever get a girl in trouble, I don't blame her. I blame you. It's your responsibility as a man to take care of her. And uh, you know, there, there were a lot of things. You know, she really you know, values. I, I find myself uh, quoting her more and more. As you know, she died three years ago, and uh, at age ninety-two. Uh, but it's amazing what she what she taught us. And it's a eighth grade education. Mm -hmm. You said that your father was the very affectionate one. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you five boys were wrestling around, getting in trouble, how would your father handle that? Well, some of my fondest memories as a young boy were uh, Dad wrestling with us on the kitchen floor. And there would be the five boys. He'd have one in, you know, one under each arm, one or two locked in his legs, and one sitting on top of him. And Mom would stand at the stove and just kind of look over and smile. And, you know, you knew everything was okay. So he he was very good that way. Uh, and the same thing like uh, playing ball. He used to play ball. He you know told you show you how to throw the ball and like what plays you should make and that type of thing. So you know. Again, after work in the evening, in the summertime, he would be out there playing catch with us. Mom would never be around for anything. She was either working or resting. Yeah. So since he played with you more, there, oh, you yeah. didn't really see those, any kind of anger from him? Oh, no, no. The anger would be simply something went wrong. That's when he would be angry. You know, something go wrong and he'd cuss a blue streak or so. Such but. As Farming equipment, or cow got out, or <coughs> something like that. But other than that, he was, you know, he's he was fun okay. to be around. Was he easy to talk to? Yes. Yeah, and that's the thing that I found, again, where he was so different from the other men, because uh, they didn't have anything to do, especially with their boys. And as they, they, you know, they referred, they had nothing good to say about their father, and they, instead of calling him father or so, the old man. And uh, whereas we called my dad, dad, pa, but uh, never the old man or something, because we, we had a relationship with him. So. Interesting. You said that your parents struggled initially. Do you ever remember your father being out of work? Well, we farmed. So uh, 
I vaguely remember he worked on the WPA, which would have been like 1938, 39. And when they built the Park Wilkie Dam, which would have been about oh, five miles northwest of our farm, maybe six, <clears throat> and they would work it you know, with a, two horses and a scraper, you know, dig out. And of course, they even worked in the wintertime, and all they did was go out, the dad said, and take out the snow, and, you know, and then in, it would blow back in again at night, and the next day they'd come and take it out again and so forth. <coughs> but other than that, he just worked on the farm. And farming was tough. You know, we, we were basically self-sufficient on the farm. We, um, we raised chickens, we raised hogs, uh, we had our garden, and, of course, milk and cream, uh, even, like, for breakfast food. Uh, we w we used the regular grinder that we used for grinding feed. Clean that out. If we were going to grind feed, we clean that out and then put corn in and grind that, and that would become our breakfast mush in the, in the morning. We cook it and, and stuff. Uh, so... Uh, it, 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 we were we were very poor, but the thing is, we were poor and didn't know it, because everybody else was in the same boat. Uh, summertime, we we didn't have money for shoes, <clears throat> so we all went barefooted, and one of the big problems was stepping on nails, and uh, those were painful things. Uh, but um, let's see, it was gonna, but it, but the, it was the same. One, one of the bad thing. Uh, unpleasant things, you want to put it that way. Uh, during the war, you couldn't get, um, it was hard to buy shirts and material. So we bought some wheat, a flour over at Linton, Jenny O flour, I think it was, Jenny flour. And the flour sacks were uh, different print. And you could use them, you take the flour sack and use it for things. Well, one of the flour sacks was <clears throat> Uh, a checkered, blue and white checkered, small checkers and so forth. And they made a shirt for me out of that. And I just cried. I had to wear that to school. And I mean, that was girls' stuff. That was not boys. Boys was denim. Not not uh, that kind of thing. But it's all we had. Uh, shoes, I remember I used to serve, I was an altar server. But we, we were so poor, I could only uh, afford one pair of shoes. And that was the one you used in the barn. And so I had to stop serving mass because mom didn't want me up there with manure in my shoes. Uh, stuff. So, uh, but we made it. Uh, but it, it, it was, we, we were basically self-sufficient. Until, I would say things got better you know, after the war. Crops were good. Prices were good. And they paid off their seed loan, which they had taken out back in the 30s, and uh, life got better. You said that you and your neighbors were all poor. Yep. What role did the church play in it? Because you mentioned you guys were all, most of you all were Catholic. We were all Catholic. Well, the church was very important, because that was the center of our activity. Uh, everything revolved around the church. We had a little store by the church, run by... Um, Daniel Kuhn. Uh, Daniel Kuhn's great, is it great or is it a granddaughter? Big granddaughter. is Sister Teresa Welder at University of Mary. And he ran the store by, uh, and uh, so that's where we got our, you know, after church we'd go over there and get some gum or things, and pop was a nickel if you had it. Uh, <clears throat> gum was a penny, you get a pack of five sticks for a penny and you know go over there um everybody was poor so you know after church people would stand around outside for a long time visiting the men visit the women visit kids would be playing tag or running uh, around <clears throat> then um uh, after the war father uh, bolte we had that hall we had built that and uh, Father Bolte got a film projector, and we would run full-length movies. So every Sunday evening, we'd have a different movie. And, you know, pay maybe 15 cents or something to, just to pay for the movie. And um, 
you know, remember like the Song of Bernadette and some of those, uh, but it'd be full feature length -like movies, uh, three reels. And uh, so, so, so we had our own community, even though I you will know, say I'm from Napoleon, but I really never got to know the Napoleon kids or anything because we had nothing to do with them. We, we were St. Anthony's. Uh, so we stayed together. And I'd, I went to high school in Zealand the one year, so again, I didn't... No, my younger brothers went to Napoleon High School, and so they got to know the Napoleon kids, but I didn't. You've mentioned your, your mom having several different roles that she did. Could you kind of go through and list all the kinds of work she did? Well, mom, mom was, uh, she was used to outside work. And so um, she did, a, I mean, she was, she did the work of a man outside. Uh, my job, being the oldest, was I would have to stay home and uh, watch the kids, like when I was six, seven, eight years old, watch the kids while mom was out in the field working with dad. Uh, I would have to fix meals. Uh, we'd, you know, peel potatoes and fry them and things and uh, cook the sausage and stuff. Uh, scrub the floors, get down on your hands and knees and scrub, scrub. that was my job. I hated it because that was girls' work and I had to do it. Uh, but mom worked. So she was a good, uh, she, she worked hard and most of her work was outside. She, she enjoyed outside work more than she enjoyed housework. Uh, Mom was, um, well, she cooked the basic meals, but she was a terrible baker. Her, her bread was like lead. Uh, her mother had the most wonderful bread, Grandma Schumacher. It was light as a feather. And Mom would bring home the, the, the yeast. They used to have uh, potato yeast and stuff, but moms just wouldn't turn out like grandmas did. So, uh, so she could cook the basic stuff. But again, the things she learned to cook were more the stuff from the vetter side. Like some of the uh, things she fixed was uh, bomgushtla. I don't know if you ever heard of those. Bomgushtla, now that's the vetter side, so you would be more on the locker and the schumacher side. But bomgushtla were little tea biscuits you would make. Uh, they were small. And then you would take garlic and you dice it up. And then you would uh, put hot oil over the garlic and, and then mix it. And you pour the garlic and the hot oil over the little biscuits. Then you would have bean soup, bona soup. And, you'd, and then you would eat it. Now the only time we had that was in the winter when the roads were blocked. So that you know, because you smelled of garlic after you ate all that stuff. So you would have it only when you had. Some other in interesting things was um, we had our own still. So we made our own whiskey. And uh, my youngest brother still has the still. I don't think he's ever used it, but he still has it. Uh, but he, uh, we would have about, we had a little barrel of, uh, I think it was of 8 or 15 gallon wooden barrel <clears throat> now we have that behind the the big furnace and we'd make the mash and you'd use uh, 25 pounds of sugar and water and we had boiled potatoes and then some uh, oranges uh, slice up some oranges for flavor orange flavor and then you would let that ferment for about eight days it you know depended on how the temperature was behind the stove if it was warm enough, it would be done in eight days. Then he had a still, and the still was a kettle, a copper kettle, closed, and with a copper tube coming out, and then it would run down and it had a coil, and a little barrel, you put the coil in there, and then you would put ice in there. And so we would buy briquettes coal, and uh, you would uh, heat it, you had to heat it a certain, you, you couldn't use lignite coal, you, you could, but it was t harder to control the temperature because if you got it too hot, the, wa the water would also boil. See, alcohol turns uh, to vapor before water does. 
And so you would have to have a certain, if you got too much heat, then the water would also turn to vapor. And, but out of about, out of that mesh of, I think it was eight, ten gallons or whatever, uh, we would get about two and a half gallons of 190 proof alcohol. And the way you would test that was you would take it, take it and then you would um, uh, burn it. You put light it and if it burned everything, that was pure alcohol. And then if, if it started leaving a residue, that meant you were having water in there. The alcohol was pretty well gone. So and that, that was used to make red eye, which you've heard of before. So, uh, so that was the, the wedding, the wedding uh, whiskey and stuff like that. But that's what they would serve. Person, you know, people would come. First thing you'd have to do is serve them some red eye. That was always a. I can just vaguely remember the prohibition. I remember Dad and folks hiding some alcohol in tins under some dirty clothes and stuff, what they'd picked up in the prohibition. But that's that was you know, later thirties, and so I don't. That had have been five, four or five years old, and so. Your mom and dad came from such different families. Can you tell me how they met? Do you know how they well, you know, I just talked to my brothers about that, and um, because mom never talked to me about it, but brother Jim told me about that. And uh, actually, they had seen each other, I think, only about four or five times before they got married, uh, because dad was from over in. Uh, in uh, west of Hague, over Strasbourg. Mom was over in Venturia, which was probably 15, 20 miles. That was a big distance. So I'm not sure, but somebody, you know, kubbled them, um, got them together. And as I said, uh, it was a surprise, but they dated about four times before they got married. And... Uh, you know, and mom had to leave home and move in with my dad's my dad's brother, older brother who was married, and Aunt Jenny, and uh, Aunt Jenny's the one who taught her how to cook then, when she when they were living with them, and mom got married in a black dress, and it was a stormy. It was the twenty fourth of November, and it was storming at St. John's, and only a few of the people could get there, and mom and dad got there, and a few of the relatives and that was it uh, and the reason she got they got married in a black dress was it's a dress you can wear after the wedding you know it was everything see in those days when somebody like the men when they got married they got a suit and that's probably the last suit they had for a long time uh, but that's was used for funerals or weddings and that was it so mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Let's talk about your brothers and sisters. Um, tell, tell me about them. What were they like growing up? How did you guys get along? I'm in, of the living. I'm the oldest, and then uh, after me is my brother Willie. He's two years younger than I am. And um, Willie kind of he walked in my shadow. You know, I never realized it because I just doing my own thing, enjoying life, and so forth. But. Uh, he, he kind of considers himself the black sheep of the family, that he would, really wasn't recognized. And uh, <clears throat> he's an intelligent man. He just went as far as eighth grade. Uh, but he just never developed things. Then uh, Brother Mike, he's the one who took over the farm. He uh, also went only as far as the eighth grade. He did start uh, school by correspondence, high school by correspondence, but... Uh, didn't keep it up and never moved anywhere with it. But a sharp man. He taught himself uh, like electricity. He wired the entire farm. You know, 220 electricity, 110, 220, three-way switches and everything. Uh, I don't know where he picked it up, but he did. Uh, he's been very active in the community in Napoleon and he's a municipal judge and county commissioner and just very involved and you know, a sharp guy very good brother jim he was the first one to go to high school after me uh, he um he went to high school at napoleon in, in those days he went they went to high school at napoleon and brother danny the year after him went also they boarded themselves 
uh, what they would get is, is get a, a bed, uh, basement room and they'd have to fix their own, have their frying pan and fix their own meals and stuff. You know, things we wouldn't think of doing. And here are these high school kids living on their own. And uh, no, no adult supervision or anything. And they made it. Uh, he, he went on, uh, Jim went on and went, got, uh, finished high school, went into the guard, taught school, went to, graduated from Ellendale Teachers College, then went on and got his master's from NDSU in education. He just uh, retired two years ago from superintendent, from education. Then the next one was Danny. Danny was the fifth in line of the boys. And kind of the way it was, I was the one in charge. So if something needed to be done, I would, I would tell Willie, Willie would tell Mike, Mike would tell Jimmy, and Jim would tell Danny. Danny couldn't tell anybody, so he would just run off the mouth uh, and stuff or kick the dog or so forth. And even to this day, Danny's mouth runs. Uh, you know, nice guy, but um, <clears throat> he, he, was the, he was the talker and so forth. Uh, he, he left home when he was, he finished high school in Napoleon, then went to Brown Institute in Minneapolis for telegraphy and became a those days station operator for Sioux, Sioux Line. And of course, when that died out, he uh, got into full-time guard, and, and that's kind of what he's done. He's retired also now. Uh, Marianne was the next one, and Marianne was born in 1941. She left home when she was 12 and went to Hankinson as a candidate to become a nun. Uh, she went to high school there four years, uh, they would get to come home during the summertime for I th four or six weeks. That was it. Uh, don't do things like that anymore. But anyway, she did become a nun. And she was a, in the convent for about, I would say, 12, 13 years. And then left. She's married and lives in Grand Forks. And she's like, she's kind of, since mom died, she's become the mother of the family. Keeps us together and... And her basic job is looking after me. Uh, she's the one who makes sure I do this and that, uh, that I retire and do all the things. But anyway, we get along very well. Then the next one is Clarence. Uh, Clarence uh, Clarence uh, went to high school in Richerton for two years. First two years as kind of uh, thinking about priesthood. But uh, it wasn't his calling. But Clarence will be ordained a deacon in two weeks. Uh, a permanent deacon. Uh, so he's kind of getting in the back door. Kind of thing. Uh, he was, uh, he was a lot, uh, I enjoy him. He, he and I have gotten to know each other as adults because when I left, he was six years old when I left home. And uh, so we've, we've gotten to be an adult and probably we get, al I get along with him better than all of my other brothers, Clarence and Jim. And so uh, we do a lot of con back and forth. Uh, Marianne, going back to Clarence, uh, he finished high school at Napoleon. And um, uh, going back to Danny, Danny was a talker and he wasn't the best student. And so, you know, he was getting no A's. He got down, down. And no A's. So he convinced mom that Napoleon doesn't give out any A's. <laughs> <laughs> We've laughed about that, and Mom laughed about it afterwards too. But, but that's the kind. Danny was a good talker. But um, Clarence finished high school. Then he stayed on the farm, take, working on the farm, thinking of taking over the family farm. He met his wife Betty, uh, and she didn't. Even though she grew up on a farm, she didn't want to be a farmer's wife. So he'd been farming for two years, and then. He decided to go to college, so he called me up and said, I think I'm going to college. Where should he go? I said, well, I'll tell you two places not to go, NDSU and UND. I said, uh, they're too big. You've been out of school too long. Uh, you get in there, and you don't get the personal touch. I said, go to a place like Valley City or Ellendale or Mayville <clears throat> for a year or two. 
then you can transfer it to the big places. Well, he went to Allendale, went there two years, and then went to Valley City and graduated from there. And um, he's had, a, you know, a lot of fun. And he, t he graduated with a minor in German, major in math. And then uh, he taught a year at Shanley, then went into truck driving, made twice the money driving truck that he did being a teacher. And it was that for a number of years. Then he went back at UND and got a degree in computer programming. Did that for a while. And then that kind of petered out. You know, the companies would hire a computer programmer. Well, you buy things off the shelf. So he then went back to UND and got a degree in accounting and got his uh, degree and went, went on and got his, um, oh, what do you call it? Uh, certified Accountant, CPA. And now he's working for Dome Pipeline, watching the pipe. Uh, <laughs> so he's had a great education and stuff. But he, he's a lot of fun. He's the kind of guy we'd go fishing. And while we would unload the boat, he'd be out there talking. And within a half hour, he'd have all the gossip and everything that's going on in the fishing village. He would know. Um, then Loretta is the baby, and uh, she's 57. She was born in 55 now, I think, or 56, 5. She'll be 55. <clears throat> she um, was um, a year old, not even a year old, when I left home. So I never got to know her. One of the hard things is when I went in the seminary, we couldn't go home during the school year. Because we, we would get out for Christmas, but just for the day. And I was going to St. Paul, so you no know, way of getting home and back. So uh, and what used to hurt me, I'd come home and she wouldn't, she'd would run from me. And he's afraid because I was a stranger. And when I was in the seminary, I deliberately chose different jobs, summer jobs. Like in 1953, I worked in the iron mines in Hibbing, Minnesota, doing scramming cleaning up the war. 1954, I worked in the St. Joe National Forest in out of Clarkia, Idaho, uh, blister rust control and firefighting. 1955, I worked in the uh, Martin Brothers Lumber Mill out of Oakland, Oregon, uh, making plywood and stuff. I deliberately picked jobs in the summer to give me different experiences, I thought, because as a priest, I grew, I've grew, i grown up on the farm in central North Dakota. I'm going to be dealing with different people, different backgrounds, so it'd be good for me to have some. So that's what I did. So again, I wouldn't be home in the summer to get to know my sister. Uh, so she was eight years old when I was ordained, and uh, it was, you know, she was very proud, of course, by that time she knew me and things, so it was a lot of, was good. So we, we still, you know, we we, we're in contact and stuff, but uh, we're not very close because as adults. Uh, they're all married, uh, all, all seven of them. I think there are 29, my mother had, dad had 29 grandchildren uh, for the seven of them. And, uh, well, of course, great-grandchildren now and so forth. So uh, the nice thing is we're all within three, four hours' drive. You know, Bismarck, Aberdeen, Fargo, Napoleon, Grand Forks, Hillsboro. Uh, so uh, we get together. Uh, we, we've, as adults, we've really grown to enjoy each other and get together, usually two, three times a year, uh, for well, find an excuse and uh, have play cards and just enjoy and talk about the old days. Remember one time we were talking uh, one evening bunch of us were together, brothers and sisters, and we were talking about the old German sayings and how we thought that they were so stupid when we were kids. You know, they would quote them, like, oh, am, am dod, ich man sei brot. <coughs> Translated, it means one man's death is another man's bread. Very true. Another one was... Uh, Stolz wie Holz und faul wie Mischt. Proud as wood, but smelly as manure. 
you know, people are, you know, they're so big uh, on the outside, but inside there's <coughs> not much there. Another one, if a person was trying to uh, kind of suck up the Vilsi Yerodas Rigilfadina, he's trying to earn himself a red dress. A red dress would be the beautiful dress and that type of thing. Um, the one that we had the most, we thought was the most senseless of all, was when gulung geld hosh konch zuckerung roshka blows a hump. If you have enough money, you can have sugar blown up your ass. And, you know, we said, that is so stupid. But, you know, there's a lot of truth to that. You can only use so much money. And when you when you get so much, it has the same value as having sugar, <laughs> you know, blown. Doesn't do any good. And so, uh, yeah, there were a lot of those little sayings. You know, they, they come back. But it was so much wisdom distilled in some little sayings that were there. So, uh, not every day has had its night. You know, sometimes when somebody would seem to get away with something, and we would complain and say, well, look how they got away. They cheated and they got away. And Mom would say, it's not every day has had its night. And, you know, as history has shown those people, because we had one neighbor, they would cheat uh, with their hail insurance. They would harvest their crop, and then they would leave a little strip standing. Uh, not much, but a little strip. Then if, they, if there was a thunderstorm, then they had hail. They would take a, next day they'd take a whip and go out and knock the heads off with the whip, bull whip. And then they called their hail adjuster and say, look, uh, you know, the heads are all gone. We've combined the rest, but they left this standing. And so they get they get the crop and they get the hail insurance. And mom would say, Skleek the nits, they won't luck out. And they end up losing everything. So you know, a lot of these little sayings, oh, as we were growing up, so, I, you know, the family, we, as I say, we enjoy each other. You know, there's some of us who enjoy each other more than others, but what I like about the family is there's nobody who says, well, if so-and-so is there, I won't be coming. We, we all come, and we have a good time. With all these German sayings, did even the younger ones grow up learning German? No. They Nephews don't. and nieces don't know it. <clears throat> oh, your younger siblings. Oh, all of us. Yeah. Yeah. All... yeah, they all know German. And spoke it. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. They did until, I would say, mm, early 60s, middle 60s. But even when after I was ordained, go home, we'd speak German. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the amazing thing was, and we were just talking about this the other day, my mother, uh, as she got older, you know, mostly the older people, if they got older, they spoke, they reverted back to German. And my mother, the older she got, the more English she spoke. She did the opposite. So, uh, I don't know. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah, normally it does go the other way. Yeah. Since you are the oldest, do you know inter any interesting stories about your younger siblings' births? Well, we played games. Um, I remember one time, uh, my brother Jim, uh, we had an old granary, and we had... Uh, you know, old government granary was kind of high, and we had a we had a window on top, and we had a, a ladder up to it, and so we go up a couple of rungs and jump down, and finally Jim was going to beat us all. He went all the way to the top and said, "said Look, we hope as he hopes I can. Look how high I can jump." And he jumped out and broke his arm. <laughs> So we've teased him many a time over the years about how high he can jump. Uh, but we played, you know, some of the favorite games when we had, uh, get to, especially neighbor kids come over. So we had no, we had no toys. So a lot of fun was kick the can. Uh, you just take a can and kick it. And uh, see, the can was, you know, I don't even remember just exactly how it went. But somebody was it, and he would have to go and look. And uh, if he found somebody and he, that other person raised him to the can and kicked it before the one who was it could kick it, he would be it again. But if, if he could beat the, the one who was it could beat the other one, then the other one would be it. You know, we hide around different places. Uh, 
I was trying to think there was one other one. No. Ugh. I lost it. Since you were the oldest, uh, did you get a delegate off the chores? Are you going to pick the ones you like? I get, well, he saw yes and no. Did I delegate the chores? Yes. But it also meant that I was responsible. And that's something that has uh, it's kind of bugged me all my life. Uh, is I never, you know, I never had a childhood. You know, like started high school when I was 12, teaching when I was 14, you know, at age 12, I did a man's work. I mean, um, my dad was sick. I would be out there pitching bundles like any of the big the, the men and have my own wagon and do all the work. And We'd make hay, and we had two hay racks, and my job was loaded by hand, and my brother Willie would take it home, take one hay rack home and <clears throat> pull it off. By that time he got back, I'd have the other one loaded, and then he would take that. I would do a up to eight loads a day by hand with fork. Uh, I was very strong at, uh, at that time. And um, so, but the thing was, my, it was, you know, my brothers would do something wrong. They'd fight or they'd do something wrong. I got blamed because my mother would say, you're the oldest, you should have watched them. And so, even as I've grown up, I, I find criticism hard to take or have. Because when I get criticized, I would kind of revert back to being that eight-year, nine-year-old boy. And all I'd hear is, you should have done this. You should have done this type of thing. That's, I'm, I'm better at that now, but I've had to work on that uh, and getting over that. So, yes, I, I, was, uh, I delegated, but... Uh, I, I think I was fair with them. I, I, you know, I was the oldest and I was the strongest, so I didn't have any problems with fighting or, you know, because they'd lose, so. Was there a lot of competition or fighting between, especially the five boys? There was more between uh, uh, Jim and Mike. Uh, Jim was a, one week less than a year younger than Mike. Uh, his birth, and uh, and he was bigger than Mike. Uh, Jim, when he started, when Mike was six, they started school. Well, mom, Jim was as big as Mike, so mom said, "Do Konjaga, you can go too." So Jim went too. Jim didn't, he couldn't learn to count to ten that first year, or say the ABCs beyond F. And we thought, oh my gosh, we got a dumbbell on our hands. And so he flunked the first grade. Next year he went, you know, sailed right on through. He wasn't ready for school. And, he, you know, we try and, when he was that first year, we'd say, uh, we try and teach him. Yeah, Ma sagt, ich muss nicht lehre. Ma says, I don't have to learn. And so he didn't. But after that first year, he was, he was doing well and got along well. We older ones taught, especially like myself, Ta uh, taught the younger ones it's you know at home for homework at night teach them how you know go through their reading and help them with their math <coughs> and stuff I generally didn't have any homework because I got it easy so it went easy for me but you know working in those country schools they were very much like homeschooling is today you know, the older students taught the younger students uh, I remember my last year of teaching, I had 22 students, all eight grades, and I had 35 class periods a day, you know, different class periods. And uh, so I had five first graders, and that, that was a lot, uh, and trying to teach them how to read. And I had some that weren't too sharp. But uh, the older girls, like the seventh and eighth grade girls, they would take them aside. They would work with them uh, to help them. And so, and that's kind of what homeschooling is doing. Homeschooling, teach, the older ones teach the younger ones. And there's a kind of a respect there. And we had that in the, I think in these rural schools. Because I, I remember when I was teaching, I thought, oh, how lucky these town teachers are. They only have one grade to teach? You know, that would be so easy. And, uh, 
but that never happened to me. So between the older sibling, the older brothers, and the younger ones, were there certain bonds? Did the certain pairs? There were uh, somewhat, but not too much. the The thing that was, you know, growing up on the farm, you grew into responsibility. Like when you were six years old, your job basically was to uh, pick up the eggs from the chicken coop, uh, maybe take out uh, maybe ashes or bring some coal in or something. And you got to be eight, you had to start milking or feeding the calves and the pigs. And nine, or even before, you started milking some of the easier cows. Uh, that you know, Some cows were easy to milk and others were more difficult. And... Uh, so, as you grew up, you, you know, you grew in responsibility. You knew your state, and it kind of gave you dignity as to. Uh, the funny thing was my brother Mike, he was kind of the lazy one, in a way. Um, and so Uncle Tony Scheffner from Zealand, I don't know if you ever knew him or not, but anyway, wonderful man. And he was farming, he's dead now, but... Um, he came and he needed somebody to drive a tractor. And Mike would have been about maybe nine years old at that time. <clears throat> and so he wanted to know if he could have one of us boys. So Ma said, well, if the boys agree, you can have one of them. So we sold Mike for $1.25 each. Uh, it was to Uncle Scheffner, Uncle Tony. And Mike got to be the, the tractor man. So when he would come home, you know, we'd be bucking hay and stuff or doing some. Mike got to drive the tractor. We were the grunts with the fork and doing the work like that. So he hit one up on us uh, on that. So, uh, you know, there was always, and Mike hated milking. He, with a passion, he hated milking. Then when he took over the farm, you know, he'd milk and say to mom, Melik de Bula, are you going to milk the cow, the bull, are you going to milk the bull too? You know, and... Uh, he hated, then when he farms for himself, he becomes a dairy farmer. <laughs> uh, so the tables got turned on him. But uh, so Mike was kind of, and Willie, the one after me, uh, he hired out to the welders. And so he was kind of on the outside. Now, one of the rules we had in our family was, if you work outside the farm, whatever money you get goes back to the family. You don't get to keep it. Even when I taught school, I saw the paycheck to just to sign it and then went into the family until you were 21. Uh, you got some spending money, but that was it. And my parents, is, the reason for doing that, they said, well, there isn't enough work for all of you here. And the one who goes away, if works elsewhere, if they get to keep the money, that's not fair because when we quit farming and we die, you all want your share. And so we, we were all required to pay in, pay back until we were 21. Uh, when my parents died, everything was divided eight, eight, eight ways, equally, boys, girls. Because a lot of times girls got short, short shifted on those things. But my parents said, no, they all, you all worked, you all get equal. So uh, there was some good in that. Because like I started going to dances when I was 14. Uh, and went with Alfred and Clemens, and they would get a you know a quarter whiskey, and uh, <clears throat> you'd get the bottle, and you sit in the car, and and uh, you'd, you know chuck a look, uh, so forth. And they had money to buy. I didn't, and so I would be in the back seat, and I would put it up there. They never look how much you drank, and to put it, keep it there, and then give it back. You know, they'd get drunk and throw up. I, I never. Never had that problem, but uh, but I think not having money because they got money and they wasted it. So a lot of the neighbors got to keep their money, and sometimes we complain to parents. Well, why can't we have our money? We earned it. But their point was no. Uh, so like like when I took my American school Chicago, I had um, thirty five dollars I'd gotten back from income tax from from working, and. Um, the guy came, it was May 30th, 1948. He drove into the yard, and uh, I'd written in back in November 
one inquiring about it. And he came May 30th, and he, uh, we talked and talked, and finally, Ma said, Ma said, no, you're not going to finish it anyways, a waste of money. It was $174 for three years of high school. <clears throat> Textbooks and stuff. So uh, he said, well, you can pay $25 down and $10 a month. So folks said, well, if you make the $25 down, we will pay the $10 a month. And I had that $35 saved up. So I paid my $25 down, and that's how I got my high school, and they paid the $10 a month. Oh, how did I get on that? <laughs> Not having as much money. Yeah, so I, that's all money. That's the only money I had. You know, it, uh, it, we were very frugal. Uh, but it, it worked out for our family, and, and all of us, and it was true for all of us that uh, we all turned it in. You know, like Brother Danny, he probably made more money than any of us <clears throat> because he got into the railroad and things, but he had to pay his, send it in too. I mean, he got to keep a certain portion to pay, but other than that, so it, it worked out well. You've mentioned one of the good memories you have is the community that you grew up in. What other kind of activities did you get together for besides softball games and church? Well, uh, I t talked about the winter times. They were fun, uh, where we would you know get together, play cards. I mean, you know, sometimes you'd have you'd go four, five, six miles, and as you go each one's farm, you would go through and uh, uh, pick up the kids and go, and then we get there. You'd make the ice cream, play cards, and have fun. And then you come back home and drop them off. Uh, that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of camaraderie and, and things like that. Uh, one of the things I remember one time, that's when I was teaching. Uh, we went through one of the students' farms, farmyard, and there was was quiet. So we went into the barn and we took the horse's harness and harnessed up a cow <laughs> and then fled. He never, he suspected who it was, but he never found out. <laughs> so, you know, next morning he gets out, look, a scout, and she's <laughs> wearing a harness. <laughs> That's quite an image. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had harmless fun, you know, things like that. We never destroyed anything like the things you see nowadays, the destruction. Yeah, that was not true, because people work too hard for things to destroy. So, well. Uh, we went to dances, um, and that was a lot of fun. And you would, uh, if you took a girl to the dance, <clears throat> the rule was you would dance the first dance with her when you came into the dance hall. You would dance the intermission dance, which would be about 11.30, there was an intermission dance. You'd dance that one. Then you would go out for coffee or something at the cafe or things. They come back, they start up maybe about 12.30, and then 12, at 1.15 they'd play the Home Sweet Home dance, and then you dance with her. Other than that, she was free to dance all night with other guys, and you were free to dance with other girls. You weren't staying together. So you know, that was a lot of fun, because you know now I remember when I would start teaching after I was ordained, you go to these dances, and the guy takes a girl to a dance, and he's got to, she's got to spend the whole night with him. Uh, that wasn't true of us. So that, that that was a lot of fun, and I enjoyed them. And we would have dances probably, oh, usually like uh, Friday night or something at Napoleon. We had the Octagon Hall and the, uh, the Exhibit Hall. And later on after I left, they got to be too many dances, and people got split, and the fun was gone. Because, you know, this group went here, and this group went there, and you didn't have... But when I went those days, everybody was there. So, so that that dances were a lot of fun, and uh, enjoyed. So those were kind of the the things you did, because we didn't have television. Uh, we didn't get that until, I think, in the middle fifties or so, out our way. So. How about your family, your aunts and uncles and cousins? Did you guys get together? Not that much. Well, we did with some of them. The ones at Napoleon area, we had some of them there. The ones over in Strasbourg, no. In Zealand, no. Because 
when folks would go over to Strasbourg, that would be like 25 miles, uh, they would stay over milking time. So we had to stay home and do the chores. So we never really got to know the Vetter cousins. We got to know the Schumacher cousins. We had um, Uncle Jake Piatz, Sebastian Schumacher, and uh, Pius Kuhn on Catherine. Uh, so with those, we got together quite a bit and had, you know, and saw each other at dances and had fun that way. The others we didn't, is it because when they went to Zealand, uh, again they stayed over supper, so we had to stay home and milk the cows and take do the chores. Uh, so that's kind of. For religion, uh. can you tell me about Names Day celebration? Yeah, well, I'll go back. We never celebrated birthdays. I, I, I never, I don't remember a single birthday that was ever celebrated for anybody in our family, you know, when we were growing up. But you celebrated names days. Names days, that was your big day. Uh, you know, so, like, and particularly for the parents. So, like, my dad was Michael. So, same... September 29th, St. Michael, the Archangel. People would come, and there would be a big meal, usually come in the afternoon and sit around and talk and stuff, <clears throat> and then the evening, <clears throat> and then do something to have some drinks and stuff. Uh, the other big feast day was the church feast day. That was June, for us, was June 13th, St. Anthony of Padua. And uh, we would... Uh, the priest, we'd have a high mass. Those days you had a high mass, which is different from... And you'd have a deacon, subdeacon, and so forth. And priests would come so the, for, for the feast. And the whole relationship, like the Schumachers and the Vedders would come. <coughs> no matter what day of the week it was, you didn't work. That was a holiday. And so after mass, there was a big meal. And then they'd stay around again for the evening and big meal and that type of thing. Uh, that was the big, the big feast days. The weddings were the fun times. Um, weddings would usually be on Mondays, because before you got married, you had to have the bands announced three times. Bands was, Joe Susie Smith is getting daughter of so and so is getting married to Joe Brown, son of so and so. They had to be announced three successive Sundays. <clears throat> so usually they got married as soon as the third Sunday was over. It would be Monday. So the wedding would be about 10 o'clock in the morning. And then they would, after Mass, they would come and they would, uh, they would, would have to hall and they would play in, the musicians were there, and they would play in a march for the bride and groom and the gro groomsmen and so forth and the parents to march in to the hall, then they would uh, sit around and uh, you'd have the kuchen, the Hochzeitkuchen, uh, then with, made of butter, I mean not butter, cream and sugar and cinnamon, thin crust. And you would have that with red eye. And, uh, and we, one of the nice things was that the younger kids, like myself, 12, 14, 15, we were called Uftreya. <coughs> waiters. <coughs> the German word was Uftreil. And so we got to wait on these people, and of course we also got to serve the liquor. Of course, one of the things, of course I never did that, but some of them would sneak out a quart of red eye, and of course by evening some of the boys weren't around, they were laid out. <laughs> because that, uh, you've had it, I presume. Yes. And it's, uh, yeah, and it goes down easy, and you don't realize how much you've had until it's too late. And that's why it's called red eye. All of a sudden, your eyes are red, and you don't, don't you didn't think you drank that much. So, uh, but we would wait on tables at uh, at noon. Then they would dance during the afternoon, and then there was supper. Now the immediate relatives were invited for the noon meal. Then. Or usually around 6, 6.30 would be the supper. There you would invite the dis more distant relatives and neighbors and so forth for the supper. Uh, and then after the supper you would have what they call the Eredons, the honor dances. 
you know, first of all would be the bride and groom dance together. Then you would have the bride and groom dance with the uh, mother and father, you know, uh, switch. And then, uh, and then you'd get the, the ma uh, maid of honor and best man and so forth. And then after those honor dances, era dances were over, then everybody would get in. And, and so we were kids, we got to go to the dance. So the weddings were the great time. Now, one of the things about weddings <coughs> was, you know, this, these people worked hard. And weddings were usually in the fall, like November or early spring. Because you didn't have weddings during the summer, because you had to work. Yeah, there wasn't time for a wedding. So, at a wedding, the, you know, you, as a, some of these people worked hard, and they didn't get along well with their neighbors. You know, sometimes. So, you could get drunk. And then, as you were drunk, you could go over to your neighbor that you didn't get along with and call him all kinds of names and, you know, kind of stuff. And, and, of course, people say, well, he's drunk, he doesn't know what he's saying. And, of course, next day, everything is, you know, he said it while he's drunk. And it was a good catharsis. It really was, psychologically, it was a healthy thing. It was a way of unloading the, the, the frustrations and things and get them out in a kind of a, an acceptable manner. And then you went on again. And so, today, I, I remember, you know, later on, people say, oh, you know, that's so terrible, they got drunk on the wedding. No, that, that was a necessary mental health thing for some of those guys. And I can remember my dad getting drunk. And we had uh, Lawrence Feist was our neighbor who was really very feisty. Uh, and, uh, you know, the cows would get out and he would come over and he would raise hell. Uh, the bull would get over and he would pin him up and hit him with the pitchfork and stuff. And, you know, and so when... The wedding dad could get drunk and tell Mr. Feist what he thought of him, and then next day it was over and he'd go on again. And there was other guys too. So those were, even though as later on as people looked at it and said, well, that was terrible. But mental health-wise, it was good. That's, really, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What kind of meals were served at the feast day of the church? Uh, well, you would have usually at least two meats you'd have one would be chicken fried chicken that was and then you would have uh, sausage homemade sausage and then you would usually either have pork or uh, fried uh, pork like pork chops that or some beef now the Sunday meal that we would have as a rule was borscht soup I presume you've heard of that borscht is a it's a Russian meal, actually. It's um, you make it with uh, you take beef uh, with bone in it, and you boil it, and you put cabbage in and uh, uh, beet leaves and stuff, and some beets, red beets, and some rice and so forth, and you would cook it. Then you would take the meat out, and then um, you would uh, cook, keep cooking until it was cooked, and then take the meat out, and then you put that into a frying pan, and then you would put some cream over it and some ketchup, and uh, we call that stunga, dunga, dunking. Uh, you would, you know, dip your bread in. You'd get some, uh, get the meat out, and then eat it, and then you would, kind of like gravy, you would eat with bread, dunk it, dunk it in there. The soup, usually you'd make that on Saturdays because you, uh, then on Sunday when you ate it, you put some cream into it and some liked a little bit of ketchup in it. But it, it tasted better the second day and the third day than the first day because it, the flavor got in and you'd put in some allspice, uh, some of that stuff. That was the, sun, the regular Sunday meal as a rule was borscht soup and the meat. Well, you had some of that at the wedding, too. But even to this day, like you go up to Napoleon and they have a, a celebration, like they'll have a, the end of May, they have a St. Philip Parish, 125 years. And they'll have always sausage, two, at least two meats, then mashed potatoes and 
you know, different things. So you had your mashed potatoes, you had your gravy, uh, uh, you'd have um, cold slaw. We call cold slaw today, grout. And uh, usually you'd do it kind of fine, chop it fine, and then put on some sugar and oil and a little bit of salt and stuff. Very good. Uh, so sometimes they'd have boiled pot uh, potato salad. Now the potato salad we made is different than the potato salad you get here. Potato salad we, that we made was made with you boil the potatoes and peel them and cut them up in pieces. Then you would put uh, vinegar and oil and salt and pepper on it, and that and some onion. And that is the potato salad. Here you have mustard and some other stuff in there. That that's not German. Uh, that's the old German that we had there. So they had some of that too. And sometimes they would have rice with uh, ground meat in it, and cooked rice with some ground meat and some flavoring. I don't know. Those were the. So you usually had about a three four course meal. It wasn't just, you know, you, you, nowadays you go to a wedding reception and you sit down and you get a, maybe a small slice of ham, beef and a, maybe two or three carrots and a little bit of potato and gravy. No, there you had a full meal and they say at least two or three courses. I mean, you would have been, uh, these things, they would have been ashamed. I mean, because the big thing was the food. What were some of the other religious activities you experienced in your childhood? Well, uh, Corpus Christi Day, which would be um, uh, about ten days or so was after, uh, uh, I think it's two weeks, Thursday, two weeks after Ascension. Thursday. Anyway, we would have the Corpus Christi procession. Uh, we would uh, go out, as a Corpus Christi means body of Christ. And so uh, we would have a procession with the monstrans and would have a canopy for carried over the priest who would carry. Then there were three little houses, stations. And as we marched the whole group out of the church and uh, around to one station, the next, you would uh, pray the rosary and sing the litany of the saints. So that, that was, I mean, really stood out big. That was a big thing for us. Uh, because we would, some of us would be altar boys carrying candles and different things like that, and they'd have to run ahead to light the candles at the next station and <clears throat> so forth. Uh, that would be as far as uh, the other thing uh, that I stands out in my mind is um, Friday nights during Lent, uh, uh, we would have stations of the cross, and uh, you know faithfully we go, and there's many a time. With the old Chev 46 Chevrolet, uh, yeah, dual wheels, you take off the dual wheels and just have chains on one. And you know, we'd ride it back in the grain box. Mom and the children were in the front with Dad, and us boys had to be under some blankets in the grain box as we went to Stations of the Cross. Uh, th those were important. The other thing I remember, like during Lent, uh, after supper was over every night, uh, dishes were washed, then all of us would kneel down and pray the rosary. Dad would lead the rosary. Mom would sit on the couch or chair with the little baby. And uh, we kids had to kneel. And we had to kneel straight. You couldn't lean on anything or so forth straight for the rosary. And Dad would lead it. <coughs> then in the earlier days, he would then read us... Uh, some stories of uh, of Christ in German, uh, the you know children's stories, that type of thing. But then we did that every Lent uh, as a growing up. How much German was used in the church? Up until let's see, I would say when Father when Father Bolte came, he would have come about my eighth grade. I would have put it about nineteen fifty. Uh, everything was German in church, like the sermon, the teaching, the catechism. Like I made my first confession and first communion and totally in German, everything, on my prayers, everything was German. Then we got Father Wiedehold, uh, later became Monsignor, 
And there we started, we switched to English. Uh, but he would still preach in German uh, on Sundays. The f we had two masses on Sunday. We had an 8 o'clock mass and a 10 o'clock mass. The 8 o'clock mass, the sermon was in German. The 10 o'clock mass was in English. But about 1950 or so, when Father Bolte took over, even though he was from Germany, we switched totally to English because <clears throat> everybody knew English and so. But I, re I remember myself... <clears throat> uh, they would preach, and I couldn't. I was a, a member. Of the, I was at, uh, making a forty hours devotion at Saint. It was in nineteen forty six, and I was going to high school in Zealand, and they had a forty hour devotion at Saint John's, north of Zealand, and I was there, and I remember the priest ta ta preaching, say, "On the highland, on the highland, this, on the highland, that," and I couldn't understand what does "on the highland" mean. I mean, uh, all I could translate is uh, Holy Land, Heiliges Land, you know. And finally, at that mission, I don't know how he finally clicked, it meant our Savior, on the highland, our Savior. You know, and here I was a freshman in high school before I understood what he was talking about. So, <clears throat> because see, the sermons were in high German, and we spoke low German. So the older people, like my parents, they understood high German, even though they spoke low German, but when they wrote German and so forth, it was in high German. And uh, it would be like, let's say, the English of New York and the English of Tennessee. So people come from Tennessee to New York, like work on a network, they have to learn the New York English. Uh, the same thing. So everybody, the high German was the... the language that the church was in, the uh, sermons were in. But, uh, but it was, it, that's different from low German, Swabish, what we spoke. So we, we grew up with, <clears throat> you know, back when, you, when we grew up, when you spoke German, you could immediately tell well, who was Catholic and who wasn't. Non-Catholics spoke a different German than we did. It's a different dialect. So you, you, I mean, it was evident from the first words you spoke out of your mouth. Uh, my mother was next, the, she was the last farm, uh, and then east of them they were all Protestants. And so in her school there were both Protestants and Catholics. So mom could speak both, and she would entertain us sometimes by using the Protestant German. And of course we thought that was so funny. Uh, but um, you know, it was different. Then I, I remember... Um, one of my one of my uncles, Uncle John, was married to Aunt Margaret. Now she was a Grosna. Now Grosna comes out of Russia, a German colony called Grosna, and they were southwest of Strasbourg. They spoke what they call Grimo German, and they would use they were, their German was a little different than ours, than what we spoke. Uh, for instance, we I would say. Look, look here. He said, Lugamol. And they would say, Gukamol. Uh, it's different. Uh, we would say, a model, girl, model. They would say, Mädchen, a mage, mage and, uh, something like that. We would say, a, a horse, a Rus. They would say, a Gaul. That, that they're a little closer to the high German than what we were. So. Didn't the Catholic Church at that time have High mass and low mass. Mm -hmm. Weren't the high, I thought high masses were in Latin. Or did the old, no, the whole mass was Latin. Okay. The entire mass. Uh, the, ma the, the priest would read the epistle. He had epistle and gospel. The epistle was first read in Latin, and so was the gospel. Then the priest would read him in English. And then he would preach. So, but everything was in Latin. From from the beginning to the end, and only about 1969, 68 did we start using the vernacular, the English. So my training was totally in Latin. You know, I was ordained in the old church. Yeah. You had several different priests while you were out mm -hmm. growing up. Were you able to question them and question, ask them questions about your religion? Your oh yes. I had a wonderful relationship with Father Bolte. Uh, even when I, like when I was in a seminary, I would come home and visit, and we'd sit up until 2 o'clock in the morning discussing philosophy and religion and things like that. 
uh, the priests were very, we, we, we were very fortunate. We had some very good priests. As I grew up, the two priests that stood out in my life were Monsignor Wiedehold, Father Wiedehold. I had him from, I would say, second grade through eighth grade. And then I had Father Bolte from eighth grade until I was ordained. So uh, those are the two priests. And I remember with Father Wiedehold, when I was probably 10 or 11, I told him I wanted to be a priest. And of course, he encouraged but then as I got eighth grade, I forgot about that. She wants you there. Uh, so anyway, uh, they, uh, I was very fortunate. We had good priests that, and that were very uh, encouraged us young people. Yeah. We were talking about religion. And mm -hmm. I'm curious how your family responded and reacted towards death. Uh, well, death was kind of seen as... A reality of life. Uh, the wake service was normally held in the home. So a person was, I don't even, I don't know if they were embalmed in those days, but they were laid out, usually in the living room, in the, in the coffin, and then you'd have your wake service, you know, all night wake, and then next morning they'd be buried. And you would have people, different people taking turns. And as they sat there, they would do a little drinking and talking about stories about the person and different things like that. So it was kind of part of life, if you want to. I mean, it's not. it wasn't hidden. I mean, you got to see the people, the dead person, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, that particular picture that we have there of us boys, that was taken in 1940. Three, I think, or 42 or 43, when my sister Pauline died. Now, her coffin isn't on there. We have a, somewhere a picture of her and the boy standing around the coffin, little uh, coffin. And I remember when she died, we had her in the back bedroom for a day or two in in little coffin. You know, it was cold, so it was no problem. It was November. Uh, yeah, November. So, um, uh, then you would go to church, and uh, and the mass was said. the The grave was dug by the neighbors, and then you take it out to the grave, and they had a wooden box, and it was sitting down. And then you would let the coffin down, and you would use the reins from the horses, as for letting lowering the coffin. You let that down. And then they would uh, nail shut the top. And then there was the big, what they called uh, the shuk song, song uh, the sending song. And it was a kind of a wailing song. It just everybody would just bawl. And just, but that was a kind of, again, that was the catharsis to clean it off. So the big thing was that sending song, the shuk. Song. And uh, so it was real... You know, everybody would just break out wailing and so forth. But then you got it out of your system, and it was fine. Then, for 30 days after the funeral, if it was a relative or so, you, you had the mourning period. You could not go to dances or anything like that, no weddings, until the 30-day mourning period was over. And then when the 30-day mourning period was over, then you go on with life. So... Uh, it, it was, as I say, it was part of, it wasn't hidden away like it is nowadays. You know, some of these people nowadays, people, they look better dead than they did alive. Moses down. So, uh... Do you remember the lyrics to the wailing song? Pardon? Do you remember the words? No. Okay. Mm -mm. No. I never learned them, so... Oh, okay. It yeah. was obviously in German. Yeah, it was in German. Mm -hmm. You obviously have joined the priesthood. What was your family's reaction when you did finally join yes, and go to the seminary? Oh, they were very pleased. As I, would, as I grew up, my parents would say, you know, the greatest joy that it could ever come to our family is if one of you boys became a priest. Didn't say anybody had to, but simply say, if one of you boys would become a priest. So when I left, when I announced, it was July 4th, 1952, is when I announced, went over to Father and told him, because we had a dance at the hall, and I, instead of being at the dance, I went over to the rectory, tell him I'd want to enter the seminary. And of course, he was very good about it. 
my family supported me wholeheartedly. And in fact, uh, in a way, they paid me back in the sense that they, through the cream checks and stuff, they paid for my seminary expense. So when I was ordained, I had no debt. The family paid for it. Which in turn, when I was in the seminary and sometimes when I would get discouraged or so forth, I would remember the sacrifice they were making for me and help me to pull through and things. But it was a family effort and uh, very, very... And I know my grandparents, Schumacher, of course this is 1960, they even gave me $100 for ordination present. And that was, $100 was a lot of money in 1960. So, uh, no, it was, the family was very, relationship, just great joy. So. Were you, in, at, at the seminary, were there other German Russians? There were guys from Napoleon. Uh, Gene Schwarzenberger, he's dead now, uh, was there. But it was all English. I mean, there was no German-Russian camaraderie or anything like that. No. How do you think your upbringing influenced you at the seminary? To to do? Well, I think it, it, the whole thing is when you start a job, you finish it, and you don't turn back. And so, I, I mean, that really helped me pull through some tough times in the seminary when there were questions, should I go on or not, and things. Uh, helped me to pull through that. So, and plus the support that the, that I knew the family had, and they were counting on me to, to become a priest. Uh, not that I had to, but, you know, it was... And so I always saw myself as being, you know, of the family, not something I'm doing on my own, but it's supported by the family. And the parish community, you know, the St. Anthony Parish, very proud and all of that. And when I was ordained... Uh, you know, the dinner and all the different things they put on. and So they were very good about it. Did you ever get sent to any German-Russian parishes? No, I, I was so sure when I was ordained that I would get sent to uh, Harvey or Rugby but because they both needed associates. And since I spoke German, I could hear confessions in German, I was sure I was going to get sent there. And so my first assignment was Holy Spirit in Fargo and teach at Shanley, and I was disappointed because I said, if I wanted to teach, I taught before that, why become a priest? I mean, I could have been taught as a layman, but that's what happened. And so uh, I was at Holy Spirit for three years, and then in 1963, Bishop Dworshak called me in and said, uh, I want you to teach in the seminary. I said, well, I really don't care. I said, what do you want me to teach? He said, math. I said, math? That's the worst subject. All I've had is college algebra, high school algebra. I flunked high school geometry and college algebra. That's all. His answer was, learn it. So I had to go to NDSU and start out with a non-credit algebra course and non-credit geometry course and get a major in math. And that's what I did. While I was teaching math in the seminary. So some days I had to work like Dickens to stay ahead of my students on some of this stuff. But they learned their math. Uh, they were when they took their their ACT test. Their high scores always was math, because they had algebra, higher algebra, trigonometry, geomet regular geometry, analytic geometry, and introductory calc. They all had that. So uh, they had a good math background. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Never realized it was that extensive. Yeah, in yeah, it was. Yeah, those boys got a good education. So when they went over to NDSU, usually they were able to challenge the algebra course and stuff, move right on through. So you only had you I mean the high school through the seminary? But Pardon? You just taught the high school course of the seminary? Yeah. Did you also no, I didn't teach college, okay. just the high school. And, you know, I had a major, you know, I had a major in history, a major in philosophy, a minor in English, a minor in psychology, a minor in social studies, a minor in Latin, and... The only thing I didn't have was math, and that's what I had to teach. So uh, that's the way the church works. So in 1976, uh, I'd been to seminary in 71. I was asked to go to Holy Family in Grand Forks to be the pastor there because it had some serious difficulties. And so I went up there, and it was tough, but 
In five years, we turned it around. It was really great. Bishop Driscoll asked me to come to the to come to work in the chancery, in marriage case, tribunal, and I said, "No, I love being a pastor. Think about it." So in, that was in January 26th of 76. And then in February, he asked me again. I said, no, I love what I'm doing. March, he asked me again. And I said, I love what I'm doing. So in April, it was April 6th, I was on my way to Notre Dame for a workshop. He asked me again. And I said, Bishop, I, if I have a choice, I will not do it. But when I was ordained a priest, I promised obedience to the bishop. If you order me to do it, I will do it. If I have a choice, I won't. He said, it's finished. I order you. And so on May 24th, I left Holy Family. I sat on the driveway and I cried. I did not want to leave. But I went to, uh, then I had to go to St. Paul for three months to learn the whole technique of tribunal work and all this kind of stuff. But I would never have grown the way I grew if it hadn't been for those things. I mean, it's God's hand in it. In 1970, I, I was asked to teach psychology. Even though I had a minor, I thought, good to brush up. So I went summer school. I went over to Moorhead State, and I took abnormal psych and theory of personality development, never realizing how that stuff would work, help me in the years to come, and the stuff I just used and still use today. Uh, and as I have to analyze marriages and things like that. Uh, then in 1978, I got involved in a <clears throat> program called Beginning Experience, BE. And it's a program for separated and divorced and widowed people. And I've worked with that now, and up from 78 until now, I'm still working with it. But there, in those days, there was nothing for those people. Uh, there were two books out, one by Mel Krantz and the other one by... Virginia Satir. And that was it. And so I, I developed a 10-week course called Level 1, you know, my German way structuring. 10 weeks, two and a half hours a week class, uh, helping people just to cope with the problem uh, of just going through the divorce or d d death. <clears throat> when that was done, they said, well, is there anything else? And I got a hold of a book, When Your Relationship Ends, by Bruce Fisher. And out of that, I developed a course called Level 2, helping people to bring closure to their divorce and work through the anger. And then when that was done, they said, well, is there anything else? Well, I looked around and I found a course by Father John Powell called Fully Human, Fully Alive. And that was in personal growth to help each girl. And so I took that 10-week course, two and a half hours a week. Then, when they were done with that, they said, well, I'm, you know, I feel pretty good in starting the date, but I'm afraid I'm going to make the same mistake I made the first time. Is there anything else? And I said, well, not that I know of. So I went to Bruce Fisher, and he said, well, here's three books I would ask you to read. Pairing by Dr. Bach, Straight Talk by Sherard Miller, and The Intimate Enemy by Dr. George Bach. So I read them, I distilled them, and out of them I developed level four which they take as a couple, and we work on three basic components, intimacy, communication skills, and conflict resolution skills. And they take that with their person they're dating or so forth. Excellent course. And then uh, they said, well, you know, we're getting married, but the pre-marriage stuff that we're getting is for the young people. It doesn't suit us. So we got some more material, and we developed level five, Stepping Stones in My Brook, where we look at 15 blocks that many couples getting married a second time face and to help them identify where it's coming from and how do we work it through. And so uh, level two, level four, level five are all on videotape. And so I teach different parts of the country. In fact, today I signed off on the copyright on that and gave it back. You know, I developed them and and, it's a, and then turned it over to BE International. So, so it's been a, a great ride, and uh, if I've enjoyed it. And I still work with a lot of separated and divorced people. Mm -hmm. They've been a lot of good friends there. After having become a priest, have the, your favorite holidays shifted at all, changed? Holidays are difficult for priests. 
especially Christmas. And Easter to some extent, but Christmas most of all. Because you work hard leading up to midnight mass and then Christmas Day mass. Okay? When it's over, you come back to the rectory and you're all alone. You don't have family. You know, un unless your family's close by, and I'm fortunate that way. But still, you're, you're worn out and tired, and you don't, you know, people are home with their husband or wife, their children or grandchildren, they're celebrating, they're having fun, and you've you worked all to that point, and now you're alone. That's probably the most difficult, and most priests tell me that Christmas is very hard. Easter's a little better. It's spring, and, uh, you, you know, it's it's a little easier and you usually get you know kind of invited out or something like that but Christmas is more of a family thing so would Christmas have been your favorite holiday prior it was it was when we had Christmas at home again we were very poor and so we would you know the five boys we would get a bat each one of us would get a sm small bag of peanuts with a few candy in there and then together we would get one gift. Usually it was a little pistol with a suction cup on it and a stick that you could shoot on the stick on the wall. By the time evening was over, the, the stick was broke and the gun was gone and so forth. But uh, that was fun. Uh, the Christmas at home was fun. Yeah, enjoyed that. What was Easter like? Easter, uh, well, you had the triduum. And, you know, like Good Friday, Good Friday you did not work. That was a holy day. Um, not officially as church, but for us it was. Uh, you did not work, you fasted, you went to church, uh, usually, uh, you know, in the afternoon or so. And uh, the, well, you didn't go to the vigil service, because that was like 4 o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning. So hardly anybody went in those days. And then... Uh, Easter Sunday, of course, the big thing was coloring Easter eggs, uh, so forth. We didn't have Easter egg hunts or anything, but coloring them and just getting ready for Easter and getting, you know, kind of a new shirt or something for Easter Sunday. <clears throat> so uh, that's about all I can remember on that. Did you guys ever celebrate Fourth of July or non? No, Fourth Fourth of July was a big celebration, and again. We would get together at the church, that little store by the church, uh, the grocery store, and <clears throat> we would buy firecrackers and shoot them off, and then we'd have some foot races and that type of thing. So uh, that, that was a big day. Now you, you were obviously out in the countryside. Did you interact at all with people from the town, or only no. if they went to church? No, with, you know, a town had its own church 15 miles away. In those days, 15 miles was a long distance. And so we, we basically did not interact at all with them. We had our own, had our own community. Okay. Now, you, you mentioned that in your home there was no electricity until right. later on. Do you remember when your family got electricity on the phone? Oh, yes. Uh, they started, they were wiring up the, when I left for the seminary, which would have been 1952, they were just wire, started to wire the farm. Our, our EA was coming in. Uh, I remember when we got our first radio, and you had these big bat, uh, battery packs. And during the war, they were rationed. You could only get one, I think, every three months or so. So you have to make sure you don't listen to it too much so you could get the, the news. And uh, usually the big thing was listening to the radio. Uh, about 5 o'clock you'd have Tom Mix or Jack Armstrong or Superman. <clears throat> and at 6.30 you had the Lone Ranger. Uh, then on Wednesday nights you had Mr. District Attorney and Fibber McGee and Molly. Uh, so there were some, these old, the ones we listened to. Um, but then... I remember we got our first refrigerator. <clears throat> the first refrigerator we had was a, a kerosene refrigerator. You burn kerosene and that somehow froze the things. Uh, with the way we kept things uh, 
like summertime or so forth, we had a, <clears throat> a well, and uh, it had a, a, a well house. It dug down about eight, ten feet, and it was probably six by six. And you would put the cream down there and the milk, and it would keep it cool. And then, of course, the big thing was like when you take the 10-gallon cream can, you have to lift, <laughs> put it on your shoulder and climb up a ladder uh, and get it out. But uh, that's how we kept things cool, was that. Then, uh, like when we worked out on the field, you would have a big gallon jug, and you put a gunny sack around it and wet the gunny sack. And that would keep the water cool in the, in the jar. Uh, Let's see what else. Preserving meat was a, a, a real art, like uh, pork. Uh, you would preserve that by putting it in brine. And to know that you had enough salt in there to, to preserve it is you put a raw egg into the brine. If the raw egg floated, you had enough salt. If it didn't float, then you needed more salt in the brine. Otherwise, it, the, the meat would go bad. Uh, so they, those old people, they, they knew how to do things. And it just came from being passed on generation? Yep, yeah, it was passed on generation after generation. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So then, obviously, electricity had quite an impact on all It did. Yeah, you know, today we think, how can we live without electricity? And, you know, we did, and there was no problem. And they said they knew how to preserve meat. Um, you'd smoke, you'd cure it, you put it in brine. And then you would smoke it, kind of dry it, and hang it up in the shed. And then when you cook it, you know, become soft again. Some would freeze the like the beef. They would freeze it in the winter time. Then they'd wrap it in a sack, frozen. And then they would bury it in the green grain, and that would keep it frozen and you know until early summer or so. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. Uh, that was the big thing, Saturday night. Uh, we would go to town, and of course all the neighbor kids would be there, and you'd walk up and down Main Street. And we'd go to movie, Roy Rogers, Jane Autry, uh, so were the ones you could go for 15 cents, uh, was the ticket. And so the, we got to see those. And <clears throat> when I was in high school, the one year at Zealand, <coughs> Grandpa and Grandma could not, there was no sense going to a movie. Because as far as they were concerned, a movie was just a bunch of pictures. And if you wanted to see pictures, you can take the Sears Roebuck catalog and look at it. And so I snuck off, I think three or four times with a neighbor kid. We snuck off and went to the movie without Grandpa and Grandma knowing. Because <coughs> they had no, uh, same thing, sports. Grandpa... Schumachers, I said the Schumachers were there was just work. You know, playing ball, that's stupid. I mean, what's what's so big about that? You hit this ball and you run around in a circle. What's so great about that? You know, that was a waste of time. Yeah. Do you remember your favorite movie? Mm, not really. Favorite song, uh, yeah, that goes back to 1946, Don't Fence Me In. It was it came out that year. Do you remember who it was by? No. Mm -mm. Okay. Interesting. As a as a child, what do you think was the most difficult thing that you had to experience that you went through? Or the most challenging. Golly, I haven't given that any thought. I think one of the most difficult things was the death of. Pauline, back in 43, or 40, or 43. Uh, I always wanted a sister by the name of Pauline. Marianne was the first girl. Then folks baptized her, gave her the name of Pauline. So I was, because we had a neighbor girl who was really a nice girl, and her name was Pauline. I just really loved it. And so they named Pauline, and then she died, you know, after two weeks, and uh, that that was a very difficult thing for me as, as a child, her death. Do you think the funeral process of that 30-day mourning period? Those, that, that we were too young, so it didn't do anything there. No, it was just 
you know, gradually you overcame it and stuff. But she's the one we had in the back bedroom for about two days before we had the funeral and things. Yeah. Somebody, a carpenter, made the coffin, you know. So. Did you boys ever discuss it? Discuss the funeral? Not really. Mm -mm. Okay. Usually you don't, those things you don't discuss. Okay. Or didn't. Okay. <laughs> it seems to be the way it was. Mm hmm. During your childhood, what do you think was the most thrilling, adventurous, or scariest thing you ever did? <laughs> uh, well, the most adventurous, I didn't, it was not something I wanted, but I was raking hay, and they had a dump, uh, they had two horses pulling the rake, and uh, they got spooked. And they ran away with me sitting on the rake. And they just went. And uh, and that rake just kept dumping, dumping, dumping. And I was hanging on to the seat so I wouldn't fall off underneath the rake and get hit by the thunk tines. And they finally ran into the farmyard. And there was a chicken coop, a chicken fence, and the fence around the yard. And they got they got into a corner and they had to stop. I had some injuries, some internal injuries of that. But that was that was really the scary thing. How old were you? I would probably have been about ten, maybe something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can see that the unwilling adventurous activity. Right, and one of the horse, Nellie, was her name. We could never trust her after that. We had to get rid of her because uh, she would be fine, and all of a sudden she'd just take off. And so we just had to get rid of her. Not, not really, I don't think. Uh, I think we've pretty well covered it. I think so, too. Kind of concluding, wrapping up, why do you think it's important to share your life story? Why do I think it's important? Well, you know, visiting with my brothers, is, you know, it's sad that so much of this is lost. And um, it's part of who we are. And our grandchildren, uh, children and grandchildren, they're just beginning wishing they'd have some of that knowledge. Or even they wish they knew how to speak German. Uh, and we didn't teach it. You know, we, we were so busy becoming Americanized and becoming part of the melting pot that we just dropped the, the things that made us you know, who we were. And I think that's been a big loss. And so I, I think uh, I just got a letter from a cousin of mine. Uh, she has a picture of a rosary that used to be her grandmother's. And she thinks it came from Russia. I just got the letter yesterday, and she wants to know if I know anything about it. I don't. But, uh, but she's looking into her history again. The, uh, she has less knowledge than I do because she was born and raised in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And so she wasn't around the family as I was and her cousins and things. So she's trying to dig some of it. Yeah. But we, we've lost so much. Um, again, growing up, a man's word was sacred. I mean, there was no thing like a bill of sale. If I said, I'm selling you this car for $500, there was a handshake, that was it. Uh, it was never that, well, you can get out of this or something. No, you gave your word, and that was sacred. Yeah. And we've lost that mm -hmm. so much. Mm -hmm. Are there any other thoughts or observations? No. Uh, it was tough, but as I said earlier, you know, we were all poor and we never knew it. You know, if we, you know, we talk about poverty level today. If we had had what is considered poverty level today, we would have considered ourselves rich. You know, very rich, because uh, we just didn't have anything. But we had food, and we had each other, and we had shelter, and we had clothes for hand-me-downs and stuff, although I'm the oldest, so I got the new clothes. Uh, but, you know, but we had a great time. 
as a, growing up, with, playing with the neighbors and stuff like that. The one thing, uh, one of the neighbors came over once one day, and um, we had this dog Shep, and we had a lamb, and for I don't know for whatever reason, we got the idea of tying the dog to the lamb. You know, pulling opposite. And the dog just got scared. And, you know, and we finally untied him. And he went after our neighbor kid. And he tore a piece out of his chest. Had to take him to the doctor and get him sewed up and stuff. And from that day on, whenever that, neighbor, that kid came into the yard, we had to tie up the dog. He just... You know, he didn't, he didn't blame us, but he blamed the neighbor kid for it. You know, why we did it, I don't know. It's one of those things boys do. Uh, unexplainable. But it, it, was ter it was bad. Yeah. Then try to explain to our parents what happened. That was the worst part. <laughs> I suppose they asked why you did it. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if we ever really told them that we tied the dog up on a, with the sheep. I don't think so. Because we told him the dog went after him and bit him. So oh. it was about, you know, uh, an L shape he tore out there, you know, and had to sew it up. Wow. <laughs> I, I appreciate your time. Is, is there anybody else you would suggest to be interviewed to help capture these memories? I, I would say if you could get my Aunt Margaret up in Bismarck. Do you offhand know her address or phone number? Yeah, I do have that. Okay. Uh, and she's dying, but her mind is good. And, of course, she would goes back further than I do. Mm -hmm. And she would, have, she would have a lot more to say. Okay. Mm -hmm. If we have further questions, would you mind being interviewed again? Oh, no. Later, no problem. All right. Yeah. Great. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> okay.